Penn State football fans, it is Wednesday, March 16th. You know what that means. One day away, people, from St. Patty's Day, a few days away from the start of Penn State spring football practice. There's a pro day coming up for Penn State's former players. It's going to be a busy little March. We also have March Madness. Daniel Gallant's joining me from State College. Daniel, we, we could talk about all those things, but... Lo and behold, Wednesday morning, uh, Penn State makes it official. I was not super surprised by this. Maybe you were. Uh, Sandy Barber, though, is going to retire. Uh, I think it was. A, I think her time runs out in the summer yes. or late spring, something like that. Did I have that right? Yeah, this summer. Uh, so that's pretty big news. Sandy has been was at Penn State the first year that James Franklin was. Uh, I think she was hired in the summer of 2014. James was hired in the winter of 2014, but it is big news. How are you doing? And what was your initial reaction to the announcement from Penn State that uh, she would be done by the summer? Yeah, um, it was I was making my coffee this morning and I saw the the notification come across the phone that that Sandy was retiring. And I like you said, I I don't think it's necessarily a surprise. Um, I think. I think that it helps clear up the timeline a little bit. Um, her contract runs through 2022, 2023. And with a new president, Dr. Neely Bendapudi, starting in May, um, there, I think there are some question about, are you, you kind of have to do something with that yeah. one year. You either have to get the extension or you maybe have to move the timeline up a little bit. Um, and so I guess they went with option B moving the timeline up a little bit, which kind of makes for a, a very big transitional spring, transitional summer uh, for Penn State in a couple different areas. Yeah, and I know you remember this. She, uh, she met with the Penn State media down in Tampa a day or two <clears throat> before the Outback Bowl, I think, you know, uh, just prior to a Penn State practice finishing up. And she was asked a lot of things that day. Uh, And she was, I think, asked about her future at Penn State. I thought she was a little bit vague. And she she has she has Sandy has a way of answering questions where she doesn't duck the subject, but she kind of talks around it a little bit. Um, But I just reading the tea leaves uh, from December, Daniel, it didn't really sound to me like she was definitely 100 percent committed to coming back for another year. How about you? Yeah, I mean, Sandy's a professional when it comes to answering those types of questions. Um, And I do think that she did leave kind of the door open for for pretty much any possibility. I mean, I think that the times over the past year that she's asked about her future, she talks about how she she likes the job. uh, If she could keep doing it, she'd like to. But at the same time, that there's the the realities of the position. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that nothing that came across this morning was, was really a surprise, but it's kind of it's nice to have that that confirmation and and now we kind of know um where things are going forward and i think that there's a couple of different moving parts that are settled now that kind of make for for an interesting dynamic especially when you look at her last big move was giving james franklin that that big contract extension um so that's something that is that is kind of that's a building block in place then there's a new president um and Mm -hmm. now there's going to be a a new athletic director and and we know how much that James Franklin li- likes to talk about alignment as yeah. uh, with the administration as something that is important to him and his program. Daniel, you could argue that that is going to be the move that Sandy will be uh, remembered most for is her uh, association with James getting the contract that'll, that will have him under contract at Penn State, I think, through 2031. Uh, she did some other things as well. Um, you know, Micah Shrewsbury is now the men's basketball coach. Uh, I think she was figured very prominently in the push to renovate facility upgrades, all that. That was kind of something I think that she kind of really, really got behind a few years ago. It's still ongoing. If Penn State fans haven't been up to the Penn State uh, practice facility, uh, it's it's not a mess, but it's m- very much under construction. So that renovation is ongoing. I think she did uh, more than her fair share to get the ball rolling in that direction. But of all the things she did, I know that you, I, I know that you haven't been uh, covering Penn State since the, she got here in fourteen. Uh, other than other than James's contract, what what else kind of stands out to you? 
Yeah, I think that you look at kind of the the role that she was able to play nationally, that she was very involved uh, in kind of those those various, uh, you know, committees and councils and um, those different groups that I assume meet at some some hotel airport uh, conference rooms uh, for, for a couple of days at a time and, and go over things. I thought that that was always kind of an interesting dynamic to have an athletic director who is kind of a, a player on the national scene, or at least is, is involved with things. Um, she was on the, I think the division one, the football oversight committee. Uh, she was involved with the big tens return to play things during the pandemic in 2020. Right. Um, and I think that that's something pretty, pretty notable um, that, that she was able to kind of be active on the national stage and was someone who um, was, was kind of well-regarded enough uh, in that regard to, to be a factor there. Daniel, do you think that the the announcement was official today, Wednesday, March 16th? Do you think, though, that this was something Penn State has been preparing for and knew about prior to today? The reason I ask that, um, I'm just curious about how far along they are in the search for her successor. I My sense is I don't think Penn State was caught off guard, completely off guard by this, and I'm just wondering uh, how far – down the road they are into maybe finding her replacement. Yeah, I don't think that this would could be con- would be considered a surprise. I think that kind of what we talked about the the greater context of things where Eric Barron who hired her back in 2014, he's retiring. You have the new new president yeah. coming in. I think that this is something that has probably been there's been some machinations behind the scenes. So and you know, you talk about um, I forget. I think like when I covered the Eagles, Howie Roseman always joked about having a, a list. Um, yeah. I forget who I, I covered someone. They talk about having like the list of either candidates, players, whatever, um, in their bedside table at, at all times, just in case. And it's like James Franklin. Yep. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, whether it's Dr. Neely Benapudi or somebody else in the administration, that there's, there's always a wish list. There's always, yep. you're always keeping tabs on people. You're always trying to, to know what's going on, but. I think it'll be interesting. I mean, I don't, the athletic director position has, has changed a lot over the past, uh, you know, two decades, I guess. And so it'll be interesting to see kind of what Penn State is looking for, what type um, of administrator that, that will step into that role. Yeah. Um, let's, let's spin it forward and let's talk a little bit about something maybe the fan base might be a little bit more eager, and that is the start of Penn State spring practice. Unless Penn State changes its mind, we have a noon Monday, the 21st, I think, a noon press conference from James Franklin, expected to be in person. I'm excited about that. Uh, And I think that is actually their first official day of spring drills. Um, You know, we last saw the Penn State Nittany Lions. It was uh, the first day of 2022, and unfortunately – uh, the Outback Bowl, also known as the Opt-Out Bowl, just really got away from them in the second half. They were a depleted team. They couldn't hold a halftime lead. And it was kind of a fitting way, though, Daniel, for them for them to finish that 2021 season that saw them lose six of their final eight. But, uh, you know, it's a different year. They are excited about some young players. Uh, they have, uh, as January enroll leads, they also have a high-profile wide receiver uh, from the transfer portal coming in from Western Kentucky. There's offensive line help coming in from the Ivy League, but that doesn't happen, I think, until August practices. So in your crystal ball, what what is the most – what are some of the most important things? We're going to write about it on Penn Life. What are some of the most important things Penn, Penn State and James Franklin have to do during these practice sessions? Um, I think it starts with just integrating – the the new faces and seeing where they're at with a plan for them for August. Yeah, I think that the the big thing is going to be identifying which of these these young players could play contributing roles early. Um, and you know, I think you start with the early enrollees, mm-hmm. um, trying to figure out where Nicholas Singleton and Katron Allen are, um, where Caden Saunders is, where even Omari Evans or, or even Zane Durant. Um, the defensive lineman yeah. who we've heard a lot of good things about figuring out where those guys are and, and kind of how they can, how they can integrate them, how they can get onto the field early. Um, you're coming off a year in 2021 where only two freshmen burn their red shirts. 
Um, Kalen King, the cornerback, mm-hmm. was was a, a star last spring. We mm-hmm. we heard about him from day one, mm-hmm. and then safety Jalen Reed was someone who who came along over the course of of the fall. So I think that you'll have the chance for I think a couple more um, freshmen to potentially be involved this year, depending on how exactly things go. So I think figuring that out um, will be a a top priority and then kind of what goes along with that is figuring out how that quarterback room is going to shake out, what kind of competition is going to be there, um, how that kind of pecking order is going to uh, shake out and, and kind of maybe what Drew Aller and Bo Perula, what kind of impact they can make um, even behind the scenes, yeah. um, I think will be important because Sean Clifford's playing style is going to get banged up. Uh, Penn State didn't have a plan B ready early enough last year mm-hmm. uh, for for when that happened at Iowa. So I think that we're we're gonna we're gonna talk this into the ground. But I think how Penn State has its yeah. its backup quarterback situation ready is something that is really gonna loom large uh, this spring and, and into the fall. It's the Blue White Breakdown podcast. Bob Flounders, Daniel Gallon. I I am hopeful that that you are right about spring and the quarterbacks, but I, I, James was, I, I could see James playing it close to the vest through spring saying there's competition at every position. They're getting better every day. We really like all of them. And I could just see him just kind of steering this baby right into early August before he says anything significant. I could be wrong. I would love it if I was wrong because I'm wrong a lot, but uh, a pecking order would be good. And I think it's, you know, you, you just have to – kids, future quarterbacks are listening to this stuff, this gobbledygook, and if you're just not going to – if you're not going to come out and say, you know, if, if it doesn't look like he's ever going to play young quarterbacks over veteran quarterbacks, if, if, the, if the talent's close, I mean, why would you come to Penn State? I just I, – I really hope there's some clarity. I, I'm not expecting some clarity maybe in uh, in spring, but I, I would hope by the second week in August he's ready to – to, to say something significant, because as you say, 13-game schedule, certainly never an easy schedule. The way that Sean plays, he's going to get beat up, uh, and, it, and, and it's when you least expect it. The, the, the Iowa injury, we kinda, it kind of snuck past us. We didn't really see it happen. Then the next thing you know, uh, he was heading into the locker room, and Penn State's season was changed you know, uh, significantly. They, they could never recover. Aside from the quarterbacks, Daniel, I want to ask you <clears throat> who the by the time by the time spring is over, I want one or two names from you, and they don't have to be true freshmen. They could be second year players. They could be any a, a breakout player is a breakout player. One year he was he was James was singing the praises of Carl Nassib going into his fifth year, and we were all like, "Yeah, right." He was a <laughs> reserve defensive end. And the guy was named All-American in 2015. So, honestly, a breakout can happen at any time. Preferably, it's going to be a younger player. Give me a couple names who we, who, who we could be talking about or the coaches and players could be talking about uh, as, as we get into, like, maybe the middle of, of uh, spring drills. I think if we start on the defensive side of the ball, I think I would go with Zariah Fisher, uh, the defensive end from mm-hmm. Aliquippa. Um Chuck Losey uh, praised him uh, earlier this month when we got to see the weight room max out session. And Fisher is someone who he's going to be in his third year in the program. He switched to defensive end from linebacker last year. Um, So he's got kind of the, he's, he's been in the program for two years now and and with the position switch, being able to to change your body. And and he plays a position where he could be called on. We saw him get some reps last year, had a couple tackles here and there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he's someone who, it's definitely in line for a, a larger role, especially like with Adisa Isaac coming back. We don't necessarily know where he's going to be health wise. Um, and then I thought that last year Nick Tarbert played yeah. pretty well in the in the rotational role mm-hmm. um, uh, with with Jesse Lucetta on that side, opposite Arnold Abiketti. So I think that Fisher uh, is someone on on the defensive side of the ball that definitely interested in seeing um and then on the offensive side of the ball i mean we've i think we've talked about him a lot already but i think theo johnson could be the the big time breakout guy heard a lot of good things uh, about him behind the scenes this offseason and even when you go back and look at his production last year he was a he was a big play receiver from that tight end spot um whether it was catching balls downfield 
or even getting the ball short and making some things happen after the catch. He was, he was tough to bring down in the open field. Obviously, that tight end group as a whole struggled last year. James has emphasized that, especially <laughs> when it comes to the run game. So I think that Theo Johnson is someone who I think the expectations are already going to be pretty high for him, but I think that he can really kind of put it together um, this <laughs> spring. You stole one of my picks, Daniel. I respect it, though. I respect it. I had it written down. So I'll have to go to my – I had three names written down, so I just snuck in a fourth. I'm going to go Kobe King, the other the other king. Uh, Kalen's twin, I think, has a chance to really open some eyes. Uh, he's a he's a nice-sized athletic inside linebacker. I would, I would think that he would be getting praised a little bit. I know there's some veterans uh, in there that also uh, – you know, have a chance to really do some good things. Uh, Tyler Elston and uh, Charlie Catcher. I'm going to go Kobe King. Uh, this is a no-brainer. Nick Singleton, I think, at some point, someone's going to say something really impressive about him. I can see that coming. And I'm going to go Olu Fashanu. I think uh, I think he has to be the guy at left tackle. I don't know that they really have. I mean, you could. Pull, I guess Landon Tang, Tangwall played there a little bit, I think, in the Rutgers game. But I think Olu's the guy they want there. I didn't think he played that badly against Arkansas once he kind of got comfortable. Um, and left tackle is kind of a huge deal, I think, on the offensive line. Those those guys, Kobe King, Singleton, I'm going to go Olu Fashanu, but I think that Penn State's lost so many players, uh, good players that could get drafted, that it, there's, there's so many opportunities for players to not, not either earn starting roles or just earn high-impact roles. And we haven't even talked about the veteran that I think will be uh, looked at a little bit uh, from from Western Kentucky, Mitchell Tinsley. I think he's another guy. I know Penn State feels pretty good about their young wideouts, but Tinsley, I know that was a passing offense where they threw the ball a ton, but those are some pretty impressive numbers. They're pretty impressive numbers as, as the number two wide receiver in yeah. that group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're definitely right about Penn State losing so many players that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for for people to step up and – I think that also gives the staff a lot, a lot more flexibility this off season when it comes to moving guys around and just kind of trying things. Like that's kind of what spring football is for, um, especially when you look at the offensive line. Uh, Juice Scruggs and Caden Wallace are, are the only two returning guys, yeah. and Juice Scruggs, it seems, will be will move from right guard to center full time. Um, and I think that given kind of how we saw them use Landon Tangwall last year at both guard spots, at the tackle spots. I think that they'll be able to look at some of the younger guys and really move them around, shuffle the deck a little bit. You know, we might, you know, theoretically, if we were to show up to a practice one day and then come to the next, come the next day, there would yeah. be five different guys at five different positions um, because that, that's what you can do now. You can kind of see who you have. And obviously you have to replace a lot, especially yeah. on that defense. Um, there's, a lot of guys, a lot of moving parts, but that's where you can kind of see, all right, um, how can we use a mean Vanover or Hakeem Beeman, either inside yep. a defensive tackle, outside on defensive end? What kind of packages can we put together? How can we shuffle these linebackers around a little bit? Um, I think that that's something that'll be really interesting. Um, yep. That would be something that would be really nice to track on a, on a day-to-day kind of way. But um, I think that, you know, to kind of see when we get to the end of spring practice, yeah. if they've kind of shuffled everything up, let everything fall, let's see how it settles out. Daniel, one more guy I want to bring up because there was a little foreshadowing. I don't know if you remember when we were down in Florida and you were pulling like quadruple duty. You were also recording and producing these podcasts from your hotel room. We might have been having a couple cocktails for a couple of those podcasts. But I, at one point, <clears throat> uh, we got back from a Penn State practice, and I, I just couldn't believe uh, what a specimen Jalen Reed was, the safety. And I was like, boy, like that guy is big. Like, I, you know, Brisker's big, but this guy looks like he's even bigger than Brisker. And he is a big, thumping safety. Jair Brown's back. Brisker is not back. Um, you know, Keaton Ellis is a veteran, and a lot of people think he might be the guy that starts – uh, with Jair, especially at the start of the season. But I thought it was interesting when we went up to the weight training thing, Chuck Losey talked about he deliberately uh, kind of paired Reed with Jair Brown as kind of his workout training buddy to kind of maybe just see. I don't know why. He, I don't know if he tipped his hand. I don't know if he was trying to just just get 
uh, a prospect that he really likes uh, to see what he needs to do to get better in a hurry. But I just thought it was significant that Losey went out of his way to mention Reed was kind of – he had Brown kind of take Reed under his wing. I'm curious if maybe he can make a big move either in spring or in August and maybe end up, if not the third safety, uh, maybe be the starting safety at some point in the fall. Yeah, I definitely think so. I think that when you look at that uh, safety spot next to Brown, I think you're looking at Keaton Ellis and Jalen Reed. I think that those are the the two guys that are going to be competing for that spot. Um, and and Jalen Reed is just is just really interesting. Um, Penn State did burn his red shirt last year. Um, yeah. He did most of that on special teams, but they ran some of those three safety nickel sets where Reed was on the field with Brisker and Brown, which I think that that's always an an interesting way to kind of blend some some size yeah. and speed on the field at the same time. Um, and I think I think he'll just have the chance to to kind of just straight up compete for a starting role. They really like him. Um, he plays uh, a position where you can kind of play multiple guys. You can rotate. Um, you have the opportunity to get on the field more. Um, and I think that he looked, you know, he acquitted himself well in his practices, looked good and looked like he knew what he was doing in the bowl game. So I, I like Jalen Reed a lot. I think that he, he's going to be one of the, the younger first and second year guys that, I think has a really, really big opportunity to make a leap this year. Yeah. Don't you think if we were smart, like the whole Penn State beat would get together, maybe uh, at that strength and conditioning uh, session, and we all throw in a couple bucks and we on the honor system and we each pick like one guy who's the first guy that's going to get the breakout buzz uh, either at James Franklin's first press conference or his second one, and the winner gets the pot. So <laughs> – uh, it could be. It would have to be like a draft because I think everyone would take, you know, one or two players. So we'd almost have to do it like a rotisserie baseball draft of, of who will be the buzz player. I think we should do that every year because the lo- the winner would then have to buy for all the people that participate. What do you think? That would be interesting. Who would be who would be your first pick? Yeah, Nick Singleton. That's honestly that was that's where my head was too. Yeah, I think just Theo, based I, on to me, it's Theo or Nick. I, I just think that it's one of those two is going to be uh, one of those two is going to get, I think, a lot of uh, praise. They both look like they're really uh, physically uh, for a true freshman. He looks, you know, Saquon, Saquon Barkley never had a winter conditioning pro uh, session as a true freshman. He just showed up. He just showed up in the summer of 2015 in August practice sessions. They had like the Oklahoma. They had that running back mosh pit and he just jumped over like three defenders and Penn State put it on video, and you knew it was just a matter of time before he was in the starting lineup. I don't know if Nick can do that, but I think I think the winter conditioning is going to help him, uh, and I think that he's going to get some serious praise. Although, Kevon Lee is not a small human being, so <laughs> Nick Nick's going to have to earn it. Daniel, let me get this out of the way. It's, it is going to be St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. Tournament's already underway. Basketball tournament's already under, underway. Uh, how are you going to enjoy – uh, St. Patty's Day. I know it's a working day for both of us. And do you have any NCAA men's basketball advice for me? I already got an earful from Dave Jones uh, <laughs> yesterday. He had a lot of good things to say, though. I'm taking some of his picks to heart. Even though he chalked out and picked three number one seeds and a two seed to get to the Final Four, he did pick Kentucky to win it all. So I'll give him credit for that, unless he changes his mind, and then I'm going to really let him have it. But any advice for me on any brackets, any pools I'm in? Who's give me a give me a name? Don't get don't give me anyone hobbyists. I'm trying to win some money. I mean, so I one of my favorite things to do uh, every year is uh, I look at which of my friends' alma maters uh, get into the tournament as as low seeds. Super. Um, yeah, I had a lot of friends who went to kind of smaller schools, so yeah. I I gave kind of a shout out to some of my friends. They're kind of my you know, you, you throw the early darts uh, at a couple <laughs> yep. low seeds. See this is exactly the advice I was hoping for. Keep going. <laughs> um, and then I also, uh, like, the best pick I ever made was back in 2008. I picked San Diego uh, over mm-hmm. UConn. That was, my, that was my big pick. And the only reason mm-hmm. I, I made that pick was, was my dad got a degree from San Diego. So I'm a so big... this is not so much analysis as it is, like, gut feel. Yeah, I throw some throw some good vibes out there and, right, go ahead, and go, go ahead. from there. Um, but in terms of analysis, I, I like Iowa State um, to maybe steal Ooh. one or two games. Um, 
They're a they're an eleven seed. They get LSU in the first round. LSU just fired their coach. They're in shambles. Yeah, and Iowa State does have a uh, former Penn State basketball guard Isaiah Brockington, okay. uh, who had a had a big big year in Ames. Um, so I I kind of like that pick. Um, but I don't know. I mean, overall, I think that I was kind of in a in a similar vein to Dave, where I ended up with a uh, a lot of high seeds making it through. It looks like I have one and three two seeds. I know I have two ones and, and two twos making it through. Yeah. Um, Do you give so, Villanova any shot of doing anything? Oh, I have Villanova in the final. I'm kind of thinking about them a little bit because I think they have some good guards. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they, they usually play pretty well in a tournament. And I just refuse. I refuse to say Gonzaga, Arizona. Who's the other one? Is Kansas, Kansas another one seed? I'm just like, yeah. come on. I would really like a two or a three to win this thing or, or make a big run at it. It just doesn't seem like it's going to be one of those years where a five or a six sneaks into the final four. So I'm wondering about Villanova, but now I'm going to take a long, hard look at the Iowa State Cyclones. Plus, yeah. wasn't, that, uh, wasn't that where uh, Ashim Young, the safety from Philly, ended up? Isn't he, didn't he play some football there? He played two years at Iowa State, but now he's at Ole Miss. Uh, he he he's transferred in the, down he, to, he portaled it, didn't he? Yeah, he portaled it. Um, yeah, I have Iowa State making it to the Sweet 16 before losing to Auburn. Um, but, yeah, I okay. think Vill- Villanova, I mean, Colin Gillespie, uh, Philly kid, is that's a fifth-year guard who's kind of seen it all, like done it all. I think that love it. he's the type of player love it. who could be a, a March darling. But, yeah, I mean, I against my better judgment, I, I picked Gonzaga. Uh, to win it all, I'm I'm ready to be burned by the Jesuits again, and we'll. <laughs> I went we'll to a Jesuit school. They they could be mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let's hope that you can cut you can cut away some time Thursday and Friday, and hopefully with no more men's basketball, you can have a Saturday off to really, really, you know those those are the <clears throat> that I think that starts the Sweet Sixteen, doesn't it? No. No, this is a Sweet, no, the Sweet 16, 16 next, is the next, next Thursday. Week. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So it's the Thirsty 32. Is that it? Did I get that right? Yep. That's a good way to put it. All right. Well, I want, make, I want to make sure you have a great NCAA tournament. I uh, plan on seeing you up at uh, practice on Monday. Hopefully, uh, everything will hold there. And I know that you and Dustin Hockensmith will have another Blue White Breakdown podcast coming up uh, to record for a little bit later in the week. But the weather looks like it's going to be pretty decent, at least on Friday and maybe Saturday. I'm excited about that. Enjoy your tournament, and I'll be in touch with you soon. Sounds great, Bob.